Hey, what you reading for? Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel where I talk about books, literary, horror, classics, and contemporary. Today I am going to count down my top 10 favorite horror books from my favorite decade of horror, the 1970s. I've recently posted a three-part series on horror in the 1970s going through what I love about that decade, what makes that decade so unique for horror, the social, political, and cultural movements that uh, influenced horror, and going through a, uh, a few examples. But since I'm obsessed with lists and with ranking things, I figured I'd top off that series with a top 10 list. Now, because this list is purely my opinion, there is a very good chance that your favorite horror book from the 1970s did not make the list. So you're probably going to be tempted to uh, write me a, um, a comment, uh, Michael, how dare you forget about this book or that book? Please go ahead and send me that comment. I love hearing your reactions. Especially, I love hearing about books that you love, books that I may have missed, or books that I may not have appreciated as I should have, as much as I should have. However, I have anticipated your reactions, so after I go through my top 10 favorite horror books from that decade, I am going to take a uh, look at um, some of the popular and beloved classics of that time that did not make the list, and I'll give you my personal reasons as to why. One of those books, at least one, is going to send me off on a tiny rant-ish thing, which I normally don't like doing that kind of thing on this channel. I prefer to keep this channel positive. However, this has been building in me for some time now, and I feel like I just have to let it, let it go, let it loose. So I'm going to share a little rant with you after the list. Um, and there's a good chance that I am wrong about my take. But that's one thing that's great about uh, this booktube community. I can share my thoughts without judgment. And I can learn from other people's points of view. But I'll save that for after the top 10 list. Now, if you're new to this channel, consider subscribing. I love that the channel is growing and it's keeping me motivated to keep putting out more and more videos, so I appreciate the support. We'll look at a short montage I put together featuring some of the cool uh, book covers from horror books from the 1970s and featuring the music of the great Polish composer Enrique Goreski. And I'll see you on the other side to count down my top 10 favorite horror books of the 1970s. Kicking off the top 10 is Jaws by Peter Benchley from 1974. Now, Jaws makes this list primarily due to the strength of its opening. The first scene is spectacular. The first six or seven pages, I think, are some of the best in all of horror. In fact, I'd like to read you a short extract, the first two sentences, and then I'll skip ahead and read another sentence or two so you can get an idea of just how strong and compelling the opening is. The great fish moved silently through the night's water, propelled by short sweeps of its crescent tail. The mouth was open just enough to permit a rush of water over the gills. There was little other motion, an occasional correction of the apparently aimless course by the slight raising or lowering of a pectoral fin as a bird changes direction by dipping one wing and lifting the other. The eyes were sightless in the black and the other senses transmitted nothing extraordinary to the small, primitive brain. Skipping ahead to when the shark notices the woman in the water, the vibrations were stronger now, and the fish recognized prey. The sweep of its tail quickened, thrusting the giant body forward with a speed that agitated the tiny, 
phosphorescent animals in the water and caused them to glow, casting a mantle of sparks over the fish. Just a little taste of what is an extraordinary opening. Now the ending I quite liked as well. It was compelling and satisfying. However, the, a large part of the middle section of this book, we forget about the shark and instead we concentrate on two characters having an affair, which I just thought was gross and boring and has nothing to do with the plot. It just served to make me like the characters less. And we also, and, and also the author spends a good amount of time in the middle section of the book trying to explain why the mayor doesn't want to uh, close the beaches because he has some kind of mafia ties or something. It's quite convoluted and uninteresting. So the middle section I could do without, to be honest with you. But based on the strength of the opening and also a strong closing, Jaws makes it on this list at number 10. Coming in at number 9 is... The Omen by David Seltzer from 1976. Now, The Omen is a novelization uh, based on the movie of the same name from the same year and written by the screenwriter. Now, The Omen makes this list based on the strength of its compelling story, which opens with a fantastic moral dilemma. The U.S. ambassador to England, his wife, is pregnant, she's about to give birth. She's had um, a few miscarriages in the past, but she really, really wants a child. Unfortunately, the child does not survive the delivery, but his wife is unconscious during the delivery, so uh, she, does, she is not aware that she lost the child. And coincidentally, at the hospital, which is a Catholic hospital, uh, they, the the hospital was given, at the same time, a baby by a young woman who um, does not want to keep the baby. She doesn't have any family. She's too poor to support it. So the hospital, the priests in the hospital, they suggest passing off this orphan baby as their own. And he suggests, they suggest that to the father. That way the baby has a family and is not orphaned and the wife is spared the heartbreak of learning that uh, she lost her baby and will never have a child again. So it's a fantastic moral dilemma, what to do. And it sets up another moral dilemma, which continues throughout the story, because as it turns out, the baby that the couple are is given, uh, it turns out that the baby is uh, the son of Satan. Now, another thing I love about The Omen is that it is very 1970s. It is largely inspired by 1971's The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey, which is a Da Vinci Code meets Nostradamus uh, Bible interpretation bestseller that uh, predicts the rise of Satan, the rapture of the church, and the subsequent hell on earth. And The Omen um, makes frequent references to this uh, new um, Bible interpretation, this new uh, theology, if you will. And it makes these references in a, in a kind of Easter egg way, which I found a, a lot of fun. For example, in the beginning of the book, um, the main character is flying to Italy, I think. And he's in the plane and he's pondering, oh, oh at any given moment, um, there are 10,000 people in planes flying around the world. So if the world were to uh, um, be destroyed, there would be 10,000 survivors flying around, which is a, a direct reference to the Hal Lindsey um, interpretation of the Bible in a, and in a fun kind of way. It's also very 1970s because a large part of the book sets up this child as being a source of evil and it sets up the moral dilemma of should the father kill the child and it also has i think one of the best endings in a horror book it was a gut punch and a very 
satisfying ending as well. I, I'm going to read a short extract from you from when the uh, husband is at the hospital and the priest announces the news that they lost the baby and he makes the suggestion of passing off another baby. Your wife is safe, he said, but she will be unable to bear another child. It will destroy her, whispered Thorne. You could adopt. She wanted her own. In the silence that followed, the priest stepped forward. His features were coarse but composed, the eyes filled with compassion. Only a trickle of perspiration betrayed the tension hidden within. You love her very much, he said. Thor nodded, unable to find his voice. Then you must accept God's plan. From the shadows of a darkened corridor, an aged nun appeared, her eyes imploring the priest to join her. They came together, whispering for a moment in Italian before she departed and the priest turned again to Thorn. There was something in his eyes that made Thorn stiffen. God works in mysterious ways, Mr. Thorn, and he held out his hand. Thorn, rising, was compelled to follow. The only negative of this book is that it is a novelization, so I have a feeling that David Selter is an excellent screenwriter, but perhaps not so much an excellent novelist. The quality of the writing is weak in some places, especially in the action scenes, which are a bit clunky at times. If the quality of the writing had been better, The Omen would figure much higher on this list. As it is, it comes in at number nine. Coming in at number eight is The Totem by David Morrell. David Morrell is the author of First Blood, a book that uh, spawned the hit movie franchise Rambo. First Blood is a book that I loved, so I was excited to read some of David Morrell's horror offerings from the mid to late 1970s. And The Totem was exactly what I expected it to be. It was a well-paced, um, expertly written action horror with um, compelling and real and well-fleshed out characters. The horror in The Totem comes from a virus that works like an accelerated heightened version of the rabies virus. So there is a high uh, blood count, a high body count, and there's quite a bit of blood, but the book does not satisfy in terms of scares or creepiness. Instead, <clears throat> it focuses on action. But as far as action horror goes, The Totem is one of the best, if not the best ones of that subgenre that I've read, personally. In the United States in the 1970s, the Vietnam War and its uh, consequences, uh, that was on everybody's mind. And what David Morrell does uh, is he brings the Vietnam War back to the United States. The totem is set <clears throat> in Wyoming, and he has Vietnam uh, veterans and, and uh, non-veterans in, in the U.S. He has them engage in a... Uh, kind of guerrilla warfare in the mountains and plains of Wyoming as they hunt down these uh, animals and that, or these people that are infected with this virus. And undoubtedly, uh, like everyone, David Morrell surely has opinions, political ideas about this war, but the book is never preachy. It's just action and good storytelling. I'll read an extract from you where a vigilante posse goes into the mountains to hunt down these hippies that they think are responsible for this outbreak of the virus. You can see that something happened here. Parsons and his group looked at the barricade. The question though is, what? There weren't any bodies, but they saw the blood, the state police hats, the ripped, discarded knapsacks, the empty bullet casings. So, there really was a fight up here. That wasn't thunder, we heard. It wasn't thunder. No, it wasn't thunder. They walked around the barricade. Several of them glanced nervously toward the forest. I don't like this. Why? You think those hippies would be stupid enough to attack this many men? We don't know anything about them. We know that they've likely killed more people. I don't mind admitting. 
I'm scared. So what? You think we ought to go back for more help? You think that we don't have enough men already? I can't tell you what I think. Let's leave it that way. Atlick is in trouble. That's all anybody has to know. Or was in trouble. There are actually two versions of the totem. When David Morrell first uh, presented his manuscript to the publisher, the publisher said, uh, oh, it's too long, it's too sprawling, and why does it take you so long to introduce the main characters? And where is the love interest? So David Morrell, he, he chopped up the manuscript, cut it down in half or so, and he uh, crammed in a love interest. And the book was a big hit. Uh, when the book was reissued in 1991, it was reissued as the original or the author's version. And that is the version that I read. Uh, and it's not that long or sprawling. It's uh, like 380 pages, I believe. I think that it would be difficult to find the original uh, chopped up version. But uh, I read, so I read the author's version, if you will, and uh, I can't agree with the publisher. I, I did not need a love interest, and I certainly didn't, didn't find it overly long. It doesn't rank higher on this list simply because action horror is not my preferred genre, although I do think that this is an example of that subgenre done very well. So it's, it's not my favorite subgenre, and also it's not higher due to the strength of the other books that are on this list. Coming in at number seven is The Rats by James Herbert from 1974. The Rats is hundreds of thousands of large bloodthirsty rats infesting London. It's a short, tight creature feature that I had a lot of fun with. There is a novel narrative to it. There's a story arc and main characters, but the book also takes a almost vignette approach, giving us uh, several sometimes elaborate set pieces where people are caught in precarious situations and have to survive or often not survive uh, the attack of hundreds and thousands of rats coming at them. I'll read you a short excerpt from one of the, from the very first rat attack where uh, a guy is uh, just drinking himself to oblivion when the rats come. Suddenly he felt the pain again in his outstretched left hand. He shrieked when he realized something was gnawing at the tendons. He tried to get to his feet but only stumbled and fell heavily, bruising the side of his face. As he lifted his hands to his face again, he felt something warm clinging to it, something heavy. He tried to shake it away, but by now it had a firm grip. He pulled at the body with his other hand and felt brittle haired. Through his panic, he understood what held him in this monstrous grip. It was a rat, but it was big, very big. It could have been mistaken for a small dog, but there was no growling, no long legs to kick his body only what seemed to be razor-edged claws frantically beating on his lower arm. The Rats is exactly what it promises to be, and I think it uh, delivers quite effectively on that promise. And for that, and for the good time that I had reading it, it comes in at number seven. Coming in at number six is Carrie by Stephen King from 1974. Carrie is about a young teenage girl who is raised by an abusive, crazy, religious zealot of a mother, and Carrie's teenage awkwardness and poor upbringing make her particularly susceptible or a, a target for the bullies in her school. When she has her first menstruations, uh, it is a shock to her, and it provokes bullying from her peers, and it also sends her mother into a rage because now Carrie is becoming a woman, and women are evil, and so her mother flips out. 
And when Carrie is invited to the school prom and she decides that she is going to go, that sends her mother also into a rage. At the same time, when all of this transition is occurring in the life of Carrie, Carrie discovers her telekinetic powers. Carrie is a very 1970s book. Uh, telekinesis was huge in the 1970s. Uh, many institutions were created, founded to do research into this possibility. And Stephen King uh, uses this uh, to great effect in the book, um, citing articles and publications from these um, institutions. Articles and publications that don't exist, right? They're taken from an imagined future. But it, it plays really well in that uh, mid-70s universe. Carrie also has a, an opening that, was, that I found very strange uh, the first time I read it. It opens with a scene that is taken directly from Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House. Taken directly, it's inspired or it's a scene from The Haunting of Hill House that is reappropriated to serve the story of Carrie. And in a way that I did not know you, you could do uh, in, in literature. I, I understand that sampling is a thing in music, but I thought in books you couldn't do that, but apparently you can. I guess it's a kind of homage or a very large Easter egg. The opening passage is, uh, involves rocks raining from the sky as an indication of psychic ability which is introduced in The Haunting of Hill House, and it's how Carrie opens. I will read a short extract. This is where Carrie is trying on her prom dress for the first time. She put the dress on for the first time on the morning of May 27 in her room. She had bought a special brassiere to go with it, which gave her breasts the proper uplift, not that they actually needed it, but left their top halves uncovered. Wearing it gave her a weird, dreamy feeling that was half shame and half defiant excitement. The dress itself was nearly floor length. The skirt was loose, but the waist was snug, the material rich and unfamiliar against her skin, which was used only to cotton and wool. The hang of it seemed to be right, or would be, with the new shoes. She slipped them on, adjusted the neckline, and went to the window. She could see only a maddening ghost image of herself, but everything seemed to be right. Maybe later she could... The door swung open behind her with only a soft snick of the latch, and Carrie turned to look at her mother. She was dressed for work, wearing her white sweater and holding her black pocketbook in one hand, and the other she was holding Daddy Ralph's Bible. They looked at each other. Hardly conscious of it, Carrie felt her back straighten until she stood in the patch of early spring sunshine that fell through the window. Red, Mama murmured. I might have known it would be red. I have seen several reviews of Carrie um, where readers did not like the way it was written, the way the story is told, because essentially the story is told twice. Uh, the first time is a more traditional, straight chronological, chronological timeline of the story. And then halfway through the book, we get the story again, but it's told in flashbacks uh, using uh, tr interview transcripts and clippings from newspapers. And some people did not like that uh, approach to telling the story. They felt like, oh, you're telling the story twice. For me, I really enjoyed how the novel was presented, how the story was told. I thought it was very effective. It, it gave us the intimate story of Carrie, the person, and then it gave us the story of Carrie, the myth, the legend. And I thought uh, both were done very effectively and put together like that, it, it created a something unique and something heightened and powerful about the book. There, I do, I do enjoy subtlety in, in horror, but there is 
a certain charm when a horror book that is well written is not interested in subtlety at all. There's a certain charm to that. And I think Carrie is an excellent example of that because Carrie, uh, there's no subtlety really. Uh, the mother character is way over the top in her religious zealotry and her abusiveness and, and the contrast between Carrie and her peers and <clears throat> it's quite stark, quite night and day. And also there's the telekinesis that goes crazy and kills everyone. So it's, a, it's an over the top story, but it's well executed and I think that's part of the charm of it. Which is why it comes in at number six. Coming in at number five is Hellhound by Ken Greenhall from 1977. Hellhound is about a dog, Baxter, and Baxter is a serial killer. But he doesn't kill people uh, like you would expect a dog to kill people. He doesn't maul them or tear them apart with his teeth. Instead, Baxter, he makes it look like an accident, right? so that he never gets caught. And this story is quite a inventive and creative in that most of the story is told from the perspective of Baxter, the serial killer dog. And you know how dogs sometimes will uh, sit by the window and they'll look out and wait expectantly for their owner to come home. And then when they see their owner approach, they get all excited and they run to greet them at the door, right? Well, Baxter does that too. He sits by the window, but he doesn't wait for his owner to get home. Instead, he waits expectantly to see the younger neighbors across the street because he really wants to be with them and their family. Instead, he lives with this old lady that he's not really keen on. I'll read you an excerpt, in fact, the opening of the book, so you'll get an idea of the kind of tone we're dealing with. Each afternoon, as I lie amid the odors of dryness and age, I begin to think of the couple, and my excitement grows. I feel the warm patch of sunlight move slowly over my body. My legs twitch, and the delicate hairs in my ears begin to bristle. Soon, from among the gentle sounds of the late summer day, I'll hear the approach of their automobile. I concentrate on the sporadic drone of distant traffic. One of those sounds will suddenly become distinctive and unmistakable. At that instant, I will be fully awake. I will run to the window, push aside the limp, dusty curtains, and wait for the couple to appear. I have been close to them only once. The woman's foot was bare, and she touched my head. Her scent was exquisite, a subtle blend dominated by an acrid aroma related somehow to sexual readiness. I have seldom known such pleasure. The sound of their automobile dominates all others now, and in a moment I shall be able to see them. The man maneuvers the car unerringly into the driveway, and for a moment there is life in the neighborhood, curtains part in other windows, revealing old, resentful faces. Soon, the neighborhood is quiet again, but I stay at the window, staring at the couple's tall, neglected house. What are they doing? How do they live? If I stand rigidly and give their house all my attention, I can hear the woman's voice occasionally, but that is not enough. I want to be in their house, I want to be close enough to hear the hiss of fabric against skin as they remove their clothes. I want to put my nose against those discarded garments and distinguish the faint traces of fear and pleasure left by their bodies. Instead, I wait for the old person. She will be home soon, exhausted and uninteresting. Now, as Baxter kills off the people that are taking care of him, he ends up with a family that has a, a young boy. I believe he's about 12 or 14 years old. And this young boy, he's on to Baxter. He knows what Baxter's been up to, and he likes that. Because this boy, he has darkness inside him too, right? And he thinks it will be so much fun to have a dog that's a serial killer. Think of all the dark fun they can get into, right? But Baxter, he understands what the boy's about. And uh, Baxter is a serial killer, and you know how serial killers are. They prefer to work alone. So he's not real keen on this partnership with this young boy. So inevitably, there will be a confrontation between Baxter and this young boy. So while there is a 
fun, uh, creative, inventive tone to the first half of the book, it does go to some dark places. And, but I found the overall experience uh, great. It's a unique book. There's nothing like it really out there. And a uh, very compelling story and well executed, well done. So it comes in at number five. Coming in at number four is Ken Greenhall's first book, Elizabeth from 1976. So two Ken Greenhall books in the top 10. What can I say? He hits that sweet spot of fun horror, but also giving me a creepy and darkness that I enjoy. He manages to deliver both in equal or satisfying proportions. Elizabeth is about a young girl of 14 who is just starting to become a woman. And with that, she is starting to discover the power of her budding sensuality. Unfortunately for the people around Elizabeth, Elizabeth is not uh, what we would consider by conventional standards a good person. She has uh, murderous desires. And Elizabeth is led to believe by her grandmother that she comes from a long line of witches. So when Elizabeth looks into a mirror, she does not see a reflection of herself. Instead, she sees Francis. Francis claims that she is an ancestor of Elizabeth and she claims that she is a witch and she claims that she can help Elizabeth discover her witchy powers that will help her carry out her murderous desires and help her rid herself of uh, these adults in her life that she's not particularly fond of. I'll read a short extract uh, of Elizabeth taken from the first page. Have you ever thought about mirrors? Maybe you have. In your bathroom, perhaps, on a quiet Sunday night while you were performing one of those personal acts that you never speak of. Perhaps you were cutting the hairs that grow in the moist darkness of your nostrils. The only sound was the snipping of the tiny scissors. I hope you are not embarrassed to have me speak so frankly to you. Remember that I am no longer a child. I am a young woman. My mirror tells me so, and the eyes of men tell me so. When I was younger, I saw James, my father's brother, look from our dog to me without changing his expression. I soon taught him to look at me in a way he looked at nothing else. Elizabeth was originally published under a pseudonym, Jessica Hamilton. It was only later when Ken Greenhall had achieved a certain amount of success that the book was reissued under his name. So if you have trouble finding it under the name Ken Greenhall, try under Jessica Hamilton. The book reminded me a little bit of Shirley Jackson's We Have Always Lived in the Castle, but with a slightly more sexualized version of the protagonist. Elizabeth has fun witchiness to it. It has murder. And it has a cat named Mr. Scratch, which I discovered is a, uh, a pseudonym for the devil. I thought it was a reference to a television movie called The Devil and Daniel Webster. But it turns out that the term Mr. Scratch is just a derivation of Old Scratch, which is a pseudonym of the devil, probably coming from Middle English Scrat, which is the name of a demon, which probably comes from the Nordic Skrate, which is a Nordic demon, I guess. It turns out that uh, references to Old Scratch or Mr. Scratch can be found throughout literature, going as far back as A Christmas Carol or The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. But in Elizabeth, uh, Mr. Scratch is a cat, which is ironic because cats can never be devils. Cats are always angelic beings worthy of our admiration, praise, and worship. Coming in at number three, The Sentinel by Jeffrey Convins from 1974. 
The Sentinel begins with an unassuming creepiness. When a character, for example, walks through a graveyard at night and there's a mist on the ground, that could be creepy, but it's obvious creepy. The Sentinel takes a, a different approach. In the Sentinel, we have a young woman in her mid-twenties, and she is looking to rent an apartment in New York City. So we have a clear, relatable objective. And when she visits this uh, apartment, there are things that are off about the building and about the apartment itself. There are some red flags that she needs to uh, reasonably uh, and logically overlook in order for her to achieve her objective. And it sets a, a creepy, unsettling tone. I'll read you a short excerpt from when she visits the apartment for the first time. The burnished walls, the gold-leafed metalwork, the ceiling. It was hand-carved. Who put it in, she asked, glancing upward. A prior tenant. The ceiling was certainly an unexpected find in a rented apartment, not the type of addition one would include without an interest in the building or a long-term lease. Did you know the people? Allison asked, curiously. No, replied the agent. Allison shrugged. She patted the quilted bedspread. Little bits of dust billowed into the air, dancing in the gray light, settling into the darkness. She stood and walked back through the hallway. Miss Logan followed nervously. I want the apartment, Allison declared when they reached the brighter confines of the living room. The grandfather clock struck the hour, then resumed their frantic ticking. She turned. It's exactly what I need. Exactly. I was sure that you would feel that way. The Sentinel reminded me a lot of 1967's Rosemary's Baby by uh, Ira Levin. I think it, it shares a lot in common with that book, and I think it's, it draws inspiration from it. We have uh, a woman who, as the central character. She's in a relationship with a questionable guy. She moves into a, an old brownstone in Manhattan. Um, and we meet the characters and they're kind of quirky and a bit odd and there's a whole unsettling vibe to it. So there are a lot of similarities between The Sentinel and Rosemary's Baby. Halfway through the book, The Sentinel takes a hard shift from creepy atmospheric horror and gives us a page-turning mystery that I was really into. And until it go goes back at the end to horror for its climactic conclusion. Now, for the horror aspect of the book, it goes to some pretty outlandish places, but the story is so well written that I was happy to go along. Uh, these outlandish conceits and horror are much easier for me to swallow when the writing is done really well. And I think The Sentinel is, is a good example of that because it's quite well written and well paced and it's both creepy and has a page turning uh, mystery to it and it comes in at my third favorite horror book from the 1970s. Coming in at number two, Burnt Offerings by Robert Morasco from 1973. Now I talk about Burnt Offerings extensively in my video for Unique Haunted House book recommendations. I love this book for many reasons. Uh, firstly, it, it has a, an evil sentient house, which is super cool. And it also tells a compelling story about obsession. The story of Burnt Offerings is that uh, a family from New York City, they rent a, a summer home somewhere out in Long Island, in a remote part of Long Island. And the home is large and extravagant, but it's also... It's also been neglected and worn down. So when they go there, the, uh, the wife or the mother in this family, she sees all this opulence in, in what was once a beautiful home, and she decides that she's going to spend the summer restoring it and, and making it beautiful again, which is something that she's a bit obsessed with. She's obsessed with cleaning and, and bringing out uh, beauty. I'll read uh, an excerpt from the story when they um, 
when she discovers the house for the first time. What Walker referred to as the parlor was even more impressive, an enormous sun-filled room rounded at one end and cut with the French doors she had seen as they approached the house. An aubusson was in the middle of the room, off-white with pale rose and blue flowers. The walls were all antique boiseries, white and gold, and over the scrolled mantel of the fireplace was a Chippendale mirror that made her gasp. And God, why was the rug so worn and the walls peeling and the drapes so heavy with dust? If someone had had the taste to collect so much exquisite crystal and silver, then why weren't they responsible enough to keep it polished and gleaming? A few paragraphs later. Marion had found a coral lacquered secretary, beautifully embellished with black and gold figures against the inside wall. She touched it hesitantly at first, absorbed in the detail. Her hand followed the cool, polished curve very lightly, reaching the small finial. One piece tucked away in a corner, and it was worth more than everything they had or ever would have, as far as she could see. To be able to live with something so beautiful, not own, merely live with, for a month, two months, God. Burnt Offering does uh, a few things very well. Um, firstly, it's... It's quite creepy and scary in places. And it also works in a very 70s way to show the traditional stay-at-home housewife, to show that as something to be afraid of. It also uh, highlights not necessarily consumerism, but this, um, this obsession with outward beauty also as a negative evil thing. It does those two things quite well, and it doesn't hit you over the head with it, but it does lay the foundation for the horror that is to build in this story. I am not usually a fan of haunted house stories, but this one is done so well, and it's much more than a haunted house story, and it's quite effective, and it's my second favorite horror book from the 1970s. Occupying the top spot as my favorite horror book from the 1970s is The Stepford Wives by Ira Levin from 1972. Now, of all the books I've talked about in this top 10, The Stepford Wives is the one that most benefits from nostalgia because The Stepford Wives was a big part of my childhood. I remember seeing the made-for-television movie when I was quite young and it might have been one of my first experiences with horror, and I absolutely loved it. And as an adult, I read the book and was blown away. We all know the story, I believe. It's essentially a family, husband, wife, and two children, a son and a daughter. They move to this perfect uh, American suburb where it's perfect because the men uh, actually uh, turn their wives into robots. The story is quite layered and it works on many levels. Firstly, it's, uh, it satirizes consumerism because these uh, robot housewives, in order for them to fulfill their housewife duties, they have to keep the home incredibly clean and they can only do that with uh, products that they buy. So they're constantly shopping for cleaning products and talking about which cleaning products they should get. So it works very well as satire on that level. It also works as a criticism of a um, male chauvinistic society that treats uh, women as second-class citizens. It also works as a straight-up horror story, which is quite scary at times. And it manages, manages to do all that in like 150 pages. It's a super short tight read. I'll share with you a short extract when the protagonist, Joanna, is consulting a psychiatrist and she shares with the psychiatrist her suspicions about what is happening in her idyllic suburb. I've begun to suspect, Joanna said, 
Oh, Jesus, suspect, that sounds so... She worked her hands together, looking at us. Which men, she asked. Joanna looked at her hands. My husband, she said. Bobby's husband, Charmaine's. She looked at Dr. Francher. All of them, she said. She told her about the men's association. I was taking pictures in the center one night, a couple of months ago, she said. That's where those colonial shops are. The house overlooks them. The windows were open and there was a smell in the air of medicine or chemicals. And then the shades were pulled down, maybe because they knew I was out there. This policeman had seen me. He stopped and talked to me. She leaned forward. There are a lot of sophisticated industrial plants on Route 9, she said. And a lot of the men who have high-level jobs in them live in Stepford and belong to the Men's Association. Something goes on there every night, and I don't think it's just fixing toys for needy children and pool and poker. Ira Levin is a very camp author, whether it's his uh, debut, A Kiss Before Dying, or Death Trap, or Rosemary's Baby. He is a very pulpy, tongue-in-cheek kind of writer, and I think in Stepford Wives is when Ira Levin was in peak form. I can't recommend it strongly enough. So that is my top 10 favorite horror books of the 1970s. You may have noticed that there are some notable absences on my list. So let's talk about those now. Uh, the first being uh, The Exorcist by William Peter Blatty from 1971. Uh, basically, The Exorcist is not on my list because simply I have not read it. And uh, nor do I intend to read it. And here is where I'm going to go off on a tiny rant. I'm going to share with you my genuine feelings about this. If you disagree, please do let me know because I have a suspicion that I am missing something, that I, I am incorrect in my take on this. But uh, The Exorcist came out in 1971, so I am happy to give it a pass. Uh, I think for most people, their, their first... Um, understanding of exorcism came from this book or the movie adaptation. But now it's 2023, we know about exorcisms. Exorcisms happen. They take place notably in the United States and Uganda, but also in Europe and in South America. Exorcisms are almost always performed on children and they are an intense and grotesque form of child abuse. Uh, the child is strapped tied to the bed. They are gen gen generally starved for days on end. They are shouted at. They're having water thrown at them. They are beaten as well. Um, they're obviously illegal because they're child abuse, really. And they are done so by um, families or religious figures who believe that the child is possessed by the devil or possessed by a demon and they want to extract the demon, right? So in 2023, we have horror movies and horror books that use exorcisms and they present demon possession as a real thing. Now, I'm happy to go along with demon possession as a real thing, as a premise for horror. Where I where I'm less comfortable, where I am not comfortable is when they present exorcisms as legitimate solutions to this pro problem. It makes me feel very uncomfortable. And I want to make this clear. I am not so much as morally outraged as I am baffled. In this age of uh, social justice warriors and uh, uh, cancel culture, how is exorcism a thing that we can exploit for pop culture? Roseanne Barr can't have a television show, but we can make movies and books uh, using child abuse as a legitimate solution to a problem. I, I don't get it. And uh, to be honest with you, I read a book, a, a recent, relatively recent release that deals with exorcism, and I found it extremely problematic, and, and I did not... I did not uh, appreciate it. I didn't deal with it well. And I think that I would have the same reaction if, 
if I were to read uh, William Peter Blatty's Exorcist. And I understand that the book is about something else. It's about a, a priest who is struggling with his faith. But the whole legitimizing this method of child abuse as a, as a solution to a problem, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to go there. So anyway, I haven't read The Exorcist. It's not on this list. Another, another notable uh, absence is uh, The Shining by uh, Stephen King. Now, uh, Stephen King, I did not read Stephen King growing up. My first experience with Stephen King was his book, uh, Revival, which came out in 2014. I read that and really liked it. And then I read Dr. Sleep uh, like a month later. And Dr. Sleep being the, uh, the sequel to The Shining. Uh, so I eventually read The Shining later, and, but I read it as an adult and I read it with no, so I look at The Shining with no nostalgia and I look at it from adult eyes. And I think The Shining was written for a young, younger reader, a younger reader. I have a, uh, I have a preference for Stephen King's more recent works. I think my opinion is that he, over the course of the years, as he's been writing and writing, I think he's gotten a lot better at it. Obviously, I like uh, his early stuff as well. Carrie made my list, for example, of top 10 favorite horror books from the 70s. But I think his more recent stuff is, is, is much better than his earlier stuff. I definitely prefer Dr. Sleep to The Shining, for example. But then again, I read it at the wrong time and at the wrong age. I think a lot of people um, have a lot of nostalgia when it comes to Stephen King's earlier works, and I don't get that uh, benefit. Another book that did not make the list is uh, Interview with the Vampire by Anne Rice from 1979. I have not read this book. I am not a particularly a fan of vampires, although I really did like uh, Dracula, and I also loved uh, I Am Legend by Richard Matheson, which I know is not technically a vampire book, but the, um, the beasts or whatever, they, uh, they act, they behave like vampires. So you could make a case that it is a vampire book. Regardless, I liked it and I liked Dracula, but generally the concept of vampires that doesn't appeal to me. I've heard great things about uh, Interview with the Vampire, but I, I haven't read it and I don't intend to. And in a similar vein, I haven't read Salem's Lot, which came out in 1977, which a lot of people love and might be surprised that it didn't make my list. But there it is. Another uh, notable absence is um, Flowers in the Attic by V.C. Andrews which came out in 1979. But V.C. Andrews, for me at least, uh, was just a huge 80s icon. So I was surprised actually when I was doing research and to discover that it came out in 1979 and not 1980 or 81. Regardless, uh, it's, a, it's a YA book and YA is not a genre I'm particularly interested in. I understand it was hugely impactful and when I was a kid I had fun with it as well but as an adult it's it's not going to make my top 10. I am preparing a um, a lengthy video series uh, exploring horror in the 1980s so I'll be talking about V.C. Andrews more in that series but uh, it doesn't make my top 10 here. So do you have, uh, have you had any experience with uh, the books I've talked about on this list? Uh, I would be, I would love to hear your reactions, uh, your opinions as well. Uh, thank you for watching. I'll see you at the next video.